Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, I know it's lunchtime, it's a Thursday, there are a lot of things going on. So we really appreciate you being here to, um, to share in this conversation about what we consider to be a major crisis that faces the future of higher education in the U.S. So to kind of start out, we wanted this to be interactive too. We want to share some of the insights we found in the book, but we also want to open it up to your thoughts as well. So just as quickly as we can, just in the interest of time, I'm wondering if we could go around the table and just give each other our, our first name and our experience with student debt, if any. So perhaps you currently have a student loan, perhaps um, you're paying on student debt at, the, at this time, perhaps you never had it. But we would love if people would just give their name and, and what is your experience right now with student debt? So anyone care to My name is Gertie. I, I had a student loan uh, that uh, it's supposed to have uh, gone into uh, what, what they call it forgiveness, but now I'm still getting some feedback that, that has been totally forgiven. I don't know what the deal is, and I'm, I got to follow up on that. So, anyways, uh, it, I mean, this, uh, I just wanted to know that yeah, I've had no experience. Um, I'm Victor. I'm currently about 16 grand in student debt. I'll probably be around 25 grand once I graduate. Hi, I'm Kimberly. Are you thinking about our debt? Yeah, just your experience <laughs> with it, where, where you're at with it. Yeah. I'm in my first year of paying off. Um, I have grad student unsubsidized loans and undergrad loans as well. Okay. I'm Emily. This year I took out my first student loan, so that's super fun. But I have a twin brother, so we're both in it together, and my mom does not like it at all. It's awful. Um, I'm Gerald. I, I count myself as fortunate that uh, <clears throat> I was able to get uh, two bachelor's degrees with relatively low debt so many years ago, long ago, paid off. Outside of my experience, I've met with and these are people I know personally, friends, who are adults who've gone back to school, who are taking massive, you know, debt upwards of you know, fifteen, twenty thousand a year to pay for master's programs. They have no intention of paying back ever. Um, I'm Kimberly. I'm twenty-one. I'm in um, I graduated last year with a bachelor's degree in sociology, and so I, after that, they give you like six months, and then I did start paying back, but I stopped since I'm now back to school for the master's, so, yeah, it's not much of an experience, but hopefully. <laughs> I'm Fred, I'm very fortunate that I went to college back in the States, still actually paid for higher education. I did 77. And I'm Karen, and I was the one that went back to school, took out student loans. That my husband was a pharmacist, went to medical school, took out student loans. And in the meantime, my daughter went to college. So at one point, all three of us had massive student loans. Yeah. But we paid them back. Uh, John Gruda, I had to deal, what I was doing with my uh, master's, uh, a lot of student debt uh, I dealt with it, but uh, I thought it was amazing that everyone I knew uh, had huge debts that simply were were just were just unbelievable and I kept thinking, how is anybody going to pay that back? I really appreciate you sharing what you did because um, all too unfortunately, these stories are very common. Um, and, and just the breadth, the breadth of experiences at this table um, illustrates that uh, there are people that go back to school later in life and they, they come out with debt that, if they do the math, they have to be like 110 before it's paid off. Uh, as well as people who remember times in the late 70s, early 80s when you could still um, get out of school with maybe a thousand in debt or less, work a job uh, and be able to go and get that, um, that house or whatever that goal was after graduation. Um, so we make the case in this book that uh, student loan debt's not only a crisis, but it's something that's really hampering future generations from um, this idea of an American dream, that, that we buy a house, that we start to 
um, to think about our future, our financial futures, and that's simply not an option for a lot of people. Um, so I'll hand it over to Dr. Hartwood. <clears throat> so we thought we only have an hour with you, <clears throat> so we thought, well, what what would be the best way to share a dense book in an accessible way? So. We have a, a quote here from Jill Stein, who's endorsed the book. It's long, but she really encapsulates uh, the book quite well, so I'll read it to you for the folks in the back. And Jill says, No society has ever survived by devouring its young. But that is essentially what neoliberal America is doing. It has trapped 44 million current and former students in a spiral of debt and hopelessness through rapacious student loans, the explosive cost of higher education, and an economy of low wages and temporary jobs. The crisis has indentured generations, making them the latest cash cow of a predatory economic and political system that exploits workers, people of color, immigrants, ecosystems, and natural resources. The neoliberal agenda and the student debt crisis is a monumental collection of scholarship that can help guide us out of this crisis. It is analytic, historic, narrative, and moral as it chronicles the betrayal of younger generations, the imposition of neoliberalism, and the effects of a privatized monetary system. In exposing the depth of the crisis, this book informs, infuriates, and motivates readers to redouble our efforts to bring the national scandal of student debt to an end as a critical step towards an America and a world that works for all of us. This book is indispensable. Um, Peter McLaren, a distinguished professor at Chapman University, had this to say. Student debt has become a prison, and this excellent collection of essays raises the question of whether the, uh, the augmentation of labor power through higher education is worth the cost. This powerful text exposes the current crisis of education and courageously brings the reader face to face with the consequences of capital unchained. It should be read by all in the higher education community. To this point, there's a chapter in the book authored by a woman who has an associate's degree. And she questions whether she should go and get a bachelor's degree. And ultimately, she concludes it's not worth the risk, right, to be chained and uh, to have a uh, debt around her neck. So a couple kind of fast facts we wanted to share with you to kind of foreground um, some of the things that we found in the book. One of those is that uh, as we were writing the book, the, the total U.S. student debt, the cumulative student debt in the U.S. was 1.4 trillion. So it's ticked above 1.5 trillion and it continues to grow at a steady rate. Um, the average individual student debt nowadays coming out of school is $35,000. And at Wayne State, it's a little less, it's at 29,000, um, but still, it's a little less than the national average, but a lot higher than, um, than, than a lot of people can simply afford to do. And then also the finding that millennial men are more likely than women to default on student loan debt. However, women hold almost two-thirds of the country's uh, student debt. Um, and I'm reminded of one of the comments earlier. Uh, we have one of our authors who shares um, a very gripping, um, heartbreaking story called uh, Golden Years in the Red. And she completed her PhD uh, in her late 50s and was, is, to this day is working saddled with debt that she can't escape and, and that will very likely uh, should be paying her entire life um, without some sort of a forgiveness or some sort of a program. So this is the actual debt clock, uh, the student debt clock. It's above uh, $1.53 trillion. And you see the comparison to credit cards and auto loans. Uh, so it kind of shows uh, that it is ticking upward. So something that struck us in, in the course of researching student loan debt is the fact that it is not dischargeable. So that means that if you die, your partner, your spouse, um, they would have to assume your debt. And credit card debt, bankruptcy, uh, and other forms of, of debt do not have that non-dischargeability provision. So that's something that I think makes student debt uh, not only sort of a unique sort of debt, 
but a, an especially pernicious problem whenever um, you're graduating with, with thousands and thousands in debt with no foreseeable way uh, sometimes to pay it back. And on top of that, predatory practices by the loan companies um, where oftentimes uh, debtors are forced to pay off the interest first before they can even start <coughs> touching the principal and the interest keeps growing at a rate where they're kind of just staying in place with their balance. I mean, a lot of the stories that uh, from people that we've heard and talked to and uh, storytellers in this book. So one of the things that also I think um, sometimes makes this book, I think, maybe meaningful and accessible to people is it does share the stories of people who are grappling with student loan debt. Um, and it's everything from, as Dr. Hartlip said, um, a, a woman who has an associate's degree and thinks all the time about going back to school, but she thinks also about the financial um, burden of that. So I think what, what's neat about this book is we, we have chapters that look at monetary policy in the US. Um, and this idea that uh, we're, op we're operating on more of a, a debt-based money system um, than sometimes we realize. That juxtaposed with people's personal stories of living through debt and, and what they've had to do and sometimes uh, what they've had to reconcile along the way. So that the piece I share is actually um, about a time in my life when I was an adjunct faculty member and um, I was uh, writing a dissertation about adjunct faculty working conditions. And there was a, a big walkout at my campus um, for National Adjunct Walkout Day and I didn't walk out because I needed the check. And, and I traced that decision and, and, I, and I, you know, I'm reflexive and I critique it, but at the end of the day I admit that I needed the money and for me it would, at that time it made more sense to not make noise, not um, rock the boat, than it did to, um, to stand in solidarity with, with my fellow adjuncts who um, were protesting. The, the gross um, inequity in, in the labor wages of adjuncts on the one hand and how much students are paying to attend college on the other. So I'm going to hand this over to <coughs> Dr. Hartlett. So beyond the cute, <coughs> you know, expression, too big to fail, we were really thinking it, it was too big to, <coughs> to jail. Um, during the 2008 Great Recession, there was a $16 trillion bailout of major banks. So when we shared the debt clock, we showed this context of $1.5 trillion. So the question becomes, why not a debt jubilee? Why not forgive every, all the debt? Clearly, we, we can afford it, right? Um, and so <clears throat> what we know, as what Brandon just mentioned, the debt, student debt, is a different form of debt. Um, it's absent of uh, a lot of consumer protections. And it, it begs the question, um, you know, the purpose of higher education. So the background of the book, <clears throat> we say the student loan debt backstory obfuscates and buries the crisis in favor of a pro-capitalist storyline, which is why we center our critique around the neoliberal agenda in U.S. Uh, post-secondary education. We might begin by articulating what is neoliberalism, and for brevity we'll say it is capitalism. And so <clears throat> think of it this way. Capitalism is the ecosystem in which we all live. And I was reminded about this at the hotel we stayed at because of this and this. What's different about these two products? It's, it's still water, right? It's a, new, it's a new bottle. Same wine in a new bottle. And thinking about this, um, even within the literature that Brandon and I and Lucille were looking at, oftentimes, academics would just relabel something and think it's new. But materially, the substance is still there. And so neoliberalism, and we'll get to this, we'll open it towards the end of our presentation today, to ask you your thoughts about this phenomenon of neoliberalism in the context of higher education, but also capitalism, right? And so <clears throat> the book, uh, in the book, our strategy was to oppose but also provide future possibilities and reframe the language. Because so often as academics, we, we deconstruct and critique the hell out of things, but we don't build up and say, well, what's next? And that was a challenge, I'll be honest. 
Part three of the book was the most challenging of all parts to assemble and to write. So I'd like to just read again <clears throat> a short snippet because oftentimes professors we kind of go on tangents. I want to stay on point here. So capturing the voices of Americans living with student debt in the United States, this collection critiques the neoliberal interest-driven debt-based money system of U.S. higher education and offers alternatives to neoliberal capitalism and the corporatized university. Grounded in an understanding of the historical and political economic context, our book offers autoethnographic experiences of living in debt and analyzes alternatives to the current system. Chapter authors address real questions such as, do collegians overestimate the economic value of going to college? Right? What is the risk and what is the reward of securing debt to finance a degree, a credential, and what, how much money will you earn back? Is it worth it? <clears throat> And how does the monetary system that student loans are part of operate? Pinpointing how developments in the political economy are accountable for students' university experiences, this book provides an authoritative contribution to research in the field of educational foundations and higher education policy and finance. It's important, as you've introduced yourselves, we're here uh, and we are uh, different ages and we've grown up in different economic circumstances. The millennial or the exgenial uh, generations are ninjas, as we say in the book. They have no income, no jobs, and or assets. That's of concern, right? So <clears throat> we can't go through all of the, the kind of theoretical frameworks that we explore in the book, but there's one in particular I did want to quickly um, explain a little bit, and that is autoethnography. So has anyone heard of that term, autoethnography? Perhaps you've heard the term ethnography. Um, the idea of autoethnography is you write about um, experiences in a culture from your own lived experience. And I think especially with regard to something as um, personalized at times and as brutal as student debt, we feel, um, echoing Tim O'Brien's words and the things they carry, that stories can save us that it might be that telling stories about student debt and, and really trying to reach wide audiences and, and welcoming voices that traditionally in academic books aren't often seen, such as um, Melissa, who has an associate's degree. <coughs> Oftentimes we, we see in academic books PhDs, MAs, um, credentials. So the fact that we wanted to welcome voices from all walks of life and um, all different kind of situations uh, with their educational experience. I think that's what makes it powerful. So autoethnography is when someone really is diving into a culture and trying to write about it from their own lived experience while also turning a critical eye back on that experience. Because we also have to examine what are the assumptions, the positions, uh, the sometimes the markers of privilege that help us in certain situations with regard to debt and where sometimes do people fail in speaking out about it or telling their stories. And I, I, won't, I, I want to take that back in terms of failing to. It's more that I, I don't think there's often a stage for this and that it's really being, um, I think, promoted and, and really uh, furthered as much as um, I think emerging works are starting to. Uh, so in no way is our book the only one that, that is about the student debt crisis right now. Uh, there are many, many good titles. Um, the one, the one trillion dollar problem. There, there's several great books on, on student debt, uh, but what we try to do is offer personal stories of people's struggles with that debt. Because sometimes to understand a problem, um, if maybe you're in a different position where you didn't have that sort of situation going through school, sometimes hearing someone else's story is what allows you to relate and, and see that, that other perspective. So that's one of the main uh, if you want to call it a research method that, that you'll see used throughout the book, uh, and particularly in uh, section two, which shares the narratives of people. And, and, there's, and there's been some, I want to say criticism, but pushback saying, well, well, Brandon, Nicholas, Lucille, why focus on folks with high debt in the book? And, and there are some that have high levels of debt. Because really, the problem is not necessarily folks with saddled with 
high, large amounts of debt with grad degrees, etc. It's folks that um, might have only five thousand or even two thousand dollars of student debt, but didn't finish their program, right? Doesn't don't have job prospects, right? The one that went to a for uh, a predatory for-profit barber school, right, in Chicago, and then the the the, the school was shuttered. It's like left. What, what, what now? The Corinthian 15, right? The folks that were taken advantage of. Okay, that, that is correct. But it's also equally important and powerful to hear the stories of people, autoethnographically, of folks who um, have large amounts of debt. This theory of disaccumulation or accumulation to me was very powerful. Brandon's addressed the um, Kay's chapter about she went back, she was on welfare, she went back, got a PhD and tenure track professor. Um, accumulation theory, um, to me, speaks volumes as a young man who, who, who did a PhD early, is in the academy, and a tenure track, stable job, right? Um, I have years ahead of me to accumulate assets and value, right? Um, Kay doesn't have the years ahead of her, her golden years, right? Um, Consequently, um, I am privileged enough to own a home, right? At least I make mortgage payments. If you, if you don't have that ability to accumulate and amass wealth, well, you know, you're, you're in a tough situation. Equally um, powerful to me is intersectionality, Kimberly Crenshaw's work. We have a chapter by Antonio about um, he stutters, and he, he writes his story about debt collectors calling him. Yo, you're in default. Give us our money, right? And his inability to communicate with Fed loan servicing and whoever's servicing his loans is like, look, um, I can't communicate orally. I can't speak fluently. Can we do this via text messages? And he calls out the debt collectors of saying, look, you, you don't have these techno technologically um, tools that, that some of the population who has debt needs. And so all of this, really, all of these methods and theories um, are important, I believe, to share this, this um, situation in a more rich way, I would suppose. That's all I wanted to share. And that's where we want to kind of open it up, because it may sound a lot like we're saying people shouldn't go to college anymore. Kind of doom and gloom. <laughs> It's a crisis, it costs too much. Um, maybe we might, we might question this mythos of American higher education <coughs> that it automatically leads to uh, pathways to economic um, prosperity. I think that's kind of a myth that's been embedded from the beginning is that if you get a college degree, it guarantees a better life. It guarantees that entrance into the good life. Um, and that's one argument, that's one viewpoint, but I think we think it's a very prevalent one that still continues to persist, that there is this idea that higher education is worth that cost, and that it pays off in the end. And we're asking, we're starting to raise the question of, does it always, and who's being left out, who's being affected um, by this, and how might we imagine some ways that are more humane, uh, and, and more just, and more equitable, for, for all who want to learn in higher education. So it brings up, um, and we, we had these discussions and debates of, um, is higher education a public or a private good? Or has it ever just been one or the other? And how do we reconcile maybe if it's becoming more privatized and less public and less of an idea of this is um, what, what it's about to be an educated polity, an educated group of people. So, we just kind of want to pose these questions or open it up to your thoughts and questions to us. These are more just intended to kind of open the discussion and get people kind of thinking aloud on um, not only, you know, what do you see as the problems in, in a kind of a business model? It's also known as, you'll hear neoliberalism um, sometimes compared to the business model of higher education. So, um, Paulo Freire, and his work on the banking model of education kind of leads into this idea that uh, this kind of hyper-capitalism, what Henry Giroux has called casino capitalism, or kind of the house always wins. Uh, others have called vulture capitalism. People have called it capitalism on steroids, ultra capitalism. Uh, but we think neoliberalism is a system that is about the private, um, the private market and privatizing public areas of life. 
And we just kind of want to know what you all think about that in higher education. What, what might be the problems of that? Or are there benefits that mitigate the problems or, or, or problematize the problems? We want to kind of open it up. And this is the tension, I guess, even standing back after, we, after the book is published, right? It's thinking about the language we use to, to address a problem. So when we say, okay, this is a problem, well, how do we know it's a problem? You know, who, uh, who wins or who's winning or who's losing? But I came across uh, this economic term, uh, a wicked problem. And wicked problems are different than tame problems. And I know it's problematic that I'm even using economic language to ask, you know, to pose that question, well, um, what makes student debt a wicked problem um, worth solving, um, or at least attempt to solve? But in the conclusion, as I mentioned, part three was the most challenging, at least for me, and I think it's safe to say uh, Dr. Henze would agree, because we needed to chart a future. What would a post-neoliberal moment look like? And it's fascinating, I guess you can chime in, Brandon. We, we came to the, we reached this conclusion that um, we need a new language because we're actually utilizing neoliberal frameworks in trying to solve things, right? And that, that um. requires a lot of a lot of gray matter, <laughs> but it also requires a lot of creativity and um, ingenuity. And so it, it's kind of in that s space that we want to, we, we threw up some questions, um, but kind of get feedback from, from you all um, and, and kind of engage in not just a Q&A, but a discussion, if, if that would be appropriate for the last um, 25 minutes, I think. So... Um, yeah. Thoughts, questions, yeah. Well, I think that you brought up something really important and, and, and critical. But my, my, my initial reaction is that the current administration really doesn't give a damn. And I think, unfortunately, this will have to be postponed for eight years if, if that comes to it. Because they don't want to deal with this issue. They won't want to touch it. You're referring to the, the Trump administration, I'm assuming? So, yeah. No, they don't give it to him. And, and yeah, the story is kind of yet to be told on what will happen, but so far nothing has, and I don't see any attention being paid to it, so I'd have to agree with you on that. Absolutely. And, and one part of the book, we were, when we were proposing the book, we were considering having that part three actually do uh, kind of be called a, a comparison. Like, what are, uh, what are other countries doing differently and what outcomes are they having? So for instance, are there countries that are graduating folks with low amounts of debt, et cetera, et cetera. And what we found when looking at that was um, little work has been and is being done in that space, but we were finding that neoliberalism is spreading like wildfire. That countries that previously really had a socialized approach to higher education finance were reverting to adopt kind of more American Western practices of right um, everyone has equal opportunity and access right we're not going to guarantee equal outcome but folks if you want to go to college you can go to college we have grants if you the grants aren't enough right so despite state disinvestment you can get privatized debt, right? And you can go to college. And then it's up to you. Uh, and so that was originally a part. We, we came to the conclusion that that wasn't viable, so we kind of changed methods uh, to kind of charting the future. And then when we came to that space, we're like, damn, that's hard. <laughs> we're expecting ourselves to really um, move from ideation to actualization like it was it was hard enough to create the idea of okay we need new language but what's next well in, in my chapter um diane dean a former colleague or well, current colleague and um i we looked at work colleges and work colleges we found graduated their students 
with lower than national um, levels of debt. And we said, oh, that's, that's, that's interesting. But when you go to a work college, you're not going to see climbing walls and pools and, you know, all of these amenities. You're going to see a stripped down version, right? It's the, it's the, you know, the doors, the wheels, and the, the engine. But part of their curriculum is the work aspect, the, you know, the vocation aspect. And so I think part of it is, yes, we want to graduate students with little to no debt, but how can we do that without increasing tuition, right? I work at a university where it's unionized, so the faculty get across the board raises. Well, we're tuition driven. If states are not paying for it, how, where does the money come from, right? Uh, squeezing blood from a turnip, I think, is the expression, right? So, what are, what are your thoughts in terms of how would a model look um, that's not going to saddle our students with debt? Well, I guess my question is, um, I got a little bit of sticker shock when I saw how much I would like owe just for the semester. Because like mine, I went from being a sophomore to a junior, and then all of a sudden, I'm now paying the higher rates for the same class as like, as like sophomores or freshmen. Which is like kind of it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But I decided as a, at an older age, like I never went and got a bachelor's right out of high school. But I decided like you know what, I'm gonna go for it because I don't want to be making under fifteen dollars an hour whole life. Mm -hmm. I've got kids to take care of. So well, like how would you respond to the folks who are billionaires and don't have college degrees and, and the ones that actually are encouraging people to de-school? So like, right, don't go to That's college, right. waste your time, you gotta be creative. Start a Facebook page and somehow, right, become a billionaire, you know, is that, yeah. is that something that you subscribe to or is it necessarily, you know, you need that degree? Perhaps for well, it's, not, it's not like you always need a degree. I mean, some some people can do it without a degree. Some people can't. Some people are blessed by God greatly, and mm -hmm. some people struggle. For sure. It's and like I may not be in a position of I'm like well, the last two years twenty four thousand dollars in debt, but that doesn't mean I'm not paying, I'm not living a good life. Because yes, I'm struggling. Yes, I got collectors calling me for my credit cards, mm -hmm. but. I'm happy, pretty much, and it's like I'm enjoying going to school, and it's still a good life, mm -hmm. and I'm still looking forward to even a better life. I think um, I appreciate that anecdote you shared about how the prices kind of just jumped. Yeah. Um, and and I think that's symptomatic of this this market logic. So. Um, either we need to increase tuition if enrollments are down, or if demand is up, then we adjust accordingly that way. Um, and we squeeze our resources, and it's about efficiency, productivity. Um, I've heard terms like leveraging syn synergy in department meetings. Um, less breadth, more depth, or, or less depth, more breadth, um, depending on, on your, your school of thought there. But I think that's what we're struggling with, is how do we break out of a language that sees higher ed more and more as a marketplace? where the most credentialed and the most, the, the, the wealthiest have free, you know, they have free reign. Yeah. I mean, any logic that's not <laughs> market logic um, would be helpful. It reminds me so much of the healthcare debate right now. And I mean, this is so much bigger than, you know, <clears throat> higher ed, like now we're on looking at, you know, public schools and, you know, on down becoming privatized. But it does remind me of the healthcare debate because people are kind of starting to come around and think like, oh right, like this can't actually follow a market logic. It just can't. Like there's something just inherently wrong about charting someone who has like a genetic <laughs> disease, you know, from birth more money. Um, for me, like I think the language of citizenship is important. Like what does it mean to have like an educated citizenry that is that is like healthy in terms of like you know having all that it needs to succeed so I've been thinking a lot about that kind of citizenship language but it's yeah it's disturbing how 
how just pervasive like the market logic is. Yeah. So I, I appreciate this. I mean, I think it's a lot. It reminds me of what George Lakoff was talking about mm -hmm. to the Democrat party right now. Like we need to articulate positive values of like what this means. Yeah. Lucille, our colleague, <clears throat> in her chapters addresses this and. She frames it historically, and she, she cites some, some historical documents that actually show that um, this committee of 10 um, were having discussions, and they said, no, we don't want our K-12 students learning about political economy. So to your point about citizenship, historically, those in power have wanted its citizenry to be misinformed and ill-equipped um, and you see things like junior achievement and other neoliberal entities from the business world infiltrating and building curriculum to teach youngsters in our public schools, right? And then you heard Trump in a speech <laughs> saying, I, I love the uneducated. Yeah, yeah. I had a speech in Las Vegas, um, mm -hmm. I love the uneducated. Right, so it's Sorry, like I the did. technical skills of balancing that, your checkbook or what, what have you, right? Those technical pieces, but not understanding how interest and how money is literally printed out of thin air. And I think, just, sorry, one more thing about that too. I think um, citizenship and personhood, I think, are key to, to kind of restoring and reclaiming um, the humanity in education. Mm -hmm. Uh, because just like in healthcare, or not just like, but similarly, people are not inefficiencies to be managed or deficiencies to be um, dealt with. You know, these are people that are trying to learn, further their lives, um, and sometimes learning for its own sake, going back to school just to learn something that they're fascinated by. And, and with rising costs and uh, a, a almost guaranteed reality of debt, um, especially, um, yeah, for a lot of people, it's really tough. I think part of the problem too is that you see people are not living in communities anymore where the families are splitting off so much, so then they're not sharing with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I have a friend, she went to a, one of these little private colleges, it closed mm -hmm. completely closed completely. They closed the campus down, they, they shut it. She, work on, she was working on her degree, she was this close to getting her degree, and they shut the whole campus down. And it's one of these for-profit colleges. And I thought, how could they do that to these people? All these people spent all their time at this place, and they didn't care, oh, we, we're, 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 out of, we're out of money, we're out of no. And they just dropped all these people. And they have to start it all over again. And I think the other problem is, 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 is basically the younger generation is at a point where if they don't have a good education, they're burnt toast. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's sort of a rock and a hard place. Mm -hmm. And then if you pick a place that's private and they're getting federal funds, but then they don't care about whether they're getting the money or spending it wisely, they're out. They're out. And where are they going to go? And then they have all that debt to pay back. I think that's a very apt way to, um, to talk about this idea of the politics of disposability. So that's something that Henry Giroux writes about um, in a really good book in 2015 with Brad Evans. But it's this idea uh, that this sort of culture of, of cruelty has, has replaced this idea of kind of doing things for the greater good. And it's all about kind of um, disposing of elements, uh, uh, people, and resources that are deemed um, you know, no longer needed or, uh, and, and it reminds me of the situation in Illinois, I don't know if anyone followed that a couple years ago, but Governor Rauner uh, didn't pass a budget for two years. So my alma mater, Eastern Illinois University, actually had a plan in place to close the doors and close it down. Uh, and that was, actually we were in better shape than Chicago State University, um, which serves underrepresented students and was very close to closing and had to uh, end classes early, like in April, just to get, just to, to keep the lights on um, that long. So I think, that in, and it's no small coincidence that the, the governor of Illinois is a uh, devout businessman who subscribes to that market logic and also sometimes the accompanying austerity of let's make really hard cuts um, to the areas that 
need the money the most, and um, perhaps it, it sometimes it's, it's growing the managerial class and other things, but it's not serving students. That's, I think, the case that we try to make. Other thoughts, though? Hello. I'd like to commend you on your conclusion that language is the tool with which we will solve the uh, problems. Of course, I believe that language is the tool that creates and solves all the problems of our civilizations. Money is a concept in language. The exchange of money to achieve things is a, is a principle that you know, we created. Social construction. Human yeah. beings created this tool and this concept in the past. All the words go back to ancient Greece. It's taken us over. A tool which we created has taken over, and now it is difficult for a human being to see their value outside of the next dollar. Mm -hmm. We have somehow become inextricably tied to this concept we created. But it's at the root of all the, all the problems we see in our civilization currently. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you wholeheartedly that to move forward, we need to move forward with a vocabulary that undervalues money. Mm -hmm. And what a vexing problem. Um, I, I'm a fan of Kathy Acker. She's one of my favorite uh, kind of feminist writers. But she, she asked this question of, can we destroy the house of language from within? And I think that's a similar idea of, you know, uh, the, the vernacular of money in our culture, don't spend your time foolishly, time is money, and on and on and on. Is it, the ruling it points concept, to that. The, is the, ruling, sorry, sorry, is the yeah. ruling concept, it has attached itself to our language. Mm -hmm. And words that never had anything to do with money when they were created have been infected with the idea of money. We have more words for money than any other thing. Mm -hmm. And this idea of currency, too, that you'll hear this kind of um, cultural currency and things like that. Again, kind of speaking to the, the worth and this, this kind of money-centric idea. Worth is a good example. Mm -hmm. It had a meaning before money. Wealth, rich, value. These words had meaning before money, but now you can't say those words without people thinking money. Because as, as, as words go, so our thoughts go. And therefore, the thoughts of human beings are. It's difficult to unring a bell. Channel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're, we be, we become not not human. We're, we are simply components of an economy that that runs us, and, and we have forgotten that that we created this all. And it's that phrase, the almighty dollar. Yeah, the, says a lot. The <clears throat> it's ironic too that the price of the book is so damn expensive. So. Yeah. I, no one in this room should go out and buy the book. You should <laughs> encourage your libraries, local and university, to, to purchase it. So other people benefit beyond yourself, right? So that we can lend it and um, borrow it and photocopy and you know share. Um, in the end, we share some resources, some short resources of like, well, what do we do? So we share some links to organizations um, that do work. American Monetary, Monetary Institute, AMI, Chicago, Debt Resistor, Manuals, um, different, different um, websites and resources um, to resist um, and to become more human and aware of our current condition. I think it's so hegemonic because we're, we're, we're oppressed by consent in many regards. We're, we're giving consent to be oppressed. And, People are extracting value from us um, at every given moment, you know. The other day I had to take out $20, ironically, to buy a book <laughs> at a book talk I was at because they didn't, you know. And I had to pay a $3 service to get my own money, you know. So all of these service charges and fees and they're not producing anything, right, the, besides wealth for a corporation or an owner 
and um, it's it's problematic. I, I I'm thinking a lot about cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and you know, like, not that if it's a panacea, but like, how it, how will this um, either help hurt or complicate the current state more, right? Because there are universities that accept um, cryptocurrency, and there are also growing trends of uh, and calls for tuition-free college. So, in 2015, President Obama announced uh, the American uh, America's College Promise. Uh, and, and it was more of a blueprint for what he wanted to do. Um, but the idea was, if any, I think his quote was, if you're willing to work for it, then we want to find a way for you to go be able to go to school and afford it. And, uh, yeah. I think two of them is about to start doing a four-year free tuition. Oh, really? Yeah. Awesome. I mean, they're working on it. I don't know. I have a sister that was there, so she told me about it. I think it's going to be tough to get in. They're, they're, they're going to have like a lot of requirements. Uh, and will it be means tested or um, income based? So a wealthier family won't, you know, or a poor yeah, family will yeah. get I think there's two planning the process, there's two in the process, but I think they'll eventually go there. Mm -hmm. Like just so for like undergrad, so like mm -hmm. four years. Harvard does the same thing, so they're following yeah, their model. But I wanted to ask you. At one point, you asked us, is the value of a degree overestimated? So we were talking about getting a degree so you can make more than $15 an hour. So that this concept of, of value is always tied to money in this vernacular. Yeah, I think in the panacea, we're talking about the value of an education, of, of citizenship in particular. So how then do we... In, in talking to our students in particular, how do we shift the language and what do what, what claims should we be making? Instead of saying, well, once you get your degree, you'll be likely to make much more money. How do we shift the conversation? <clears throat> that, you know, the credential hierarchy system that we have was created by, you know, the elite class mm -hmm. and to stratify people. And I'm, I'm in the field of education, so in education, it's paradoxical or ironic to me because you have to pay to play. So for instance, right, to get more money, to get lane changes, um, increases, you need a master's degree. Well, over the lifetime, how much will you make because of that pay increase, how much will you have to pay to actually get the master's? And um, I wrote an article with Lucille that predates the book. Uh, I believe the title is Ivory Tower um, Graduates in the Red. And I discuss um, the idea that I had to pay to play, meaning I had to pay and get a PhD to enter the Ivory Tower and be a professor, which I openly knew and I openly would never doubt that decision. I'm completely satisfied, blessed, I'm lucky. But in the process, I accumulated debt. So I think, to your point, is it worth it for a social worker to amass so much debt that you will become a debt slave? Um, Jeffrey Williams talks about that, that, being a debt slave. To have no freedom, really. Also, when we introduce ourselves, it's, it's interesting because, you know, people were pretty forthright. Survey research tells us that People would prefer, you know, much rather talk about their sex lives than discuss monetary <laughs> issues. Surveys, right, have said, you know, people are willing to amputate limbs if they could discharge their debt. That's pretty severe. I will, you know, I will cut my pinky off if you discharge my ten thousand. I mean, that's pretty damn scary. Well, and just really quick to speak also to your question, Karen. I think it's even harder to decouple this idea of kind of um, humanistic, uh, people-centered education versus this, this idea of um, path to a job. And I think there's so much rhetoric right now that's really underscoring, um, go to school and we'll guarantee you have a job when you graduate. And, and I think that's important, but it is kind of further ensconcing that idea that college is more and more about getting a job than going and finding yourself mm -hmm. and, and trying to 
have that identity in becoming. Uh, and I think that, that we're all in that place. We're lifelong learners. And I think it only discourages people from that when, when sometimes it is couched only in terms of, um, of employment and, and trying to, to fast track you to that employment, get you right on the, um, uh, I think of COGS with this banking model idea, but to get you right out there, uh, guarantee it. Or even in legal education. I mean, so if you go to law school, then it's like, oh, well, you're going to go to a, a private equity firm, so then you make, uh, or a business route, as opposed to a liberal arts or a creative, or even art school. There's a chapter talking about um, MFA, um, you know, uh, MFAs in art school, how so expensive it is. But we know the whole expression of a starving artist. Like, you're never going to make that back. And so you, you are enslaved. But we do, the world needs more artists, not less artists. We need more artists, more musicians. Well, I, I, one thing that does concern me is, is this uh, low wage economy in which people, after they leave school, they're not making enough anyway. Uh, they're making very little. I mean, in, I think what is our current state? Uh, wage, uh, it's barely enough to make, and then they're fighting at the national level whether or not to even raise the federal standard. I mean, how can people live off of that? And you think, well, you know, what is the education there if people are, are if they've got all this education and they're making a low wage, what's going on here? I think, and, and I, this is, these are stark, these are provoking terms, but I think it's a culture of, on the one hand, disposability, and on the other hand, dehumanization. Because it's easy um, to dehumanize someone uh, by bringing them into this predatory system to where you can die and the debt will still be there for the person that's, that's left behind. Uh, it, it's, it's a culture of cruelty, it's a it's dis disposability. So I'm drawing on Henry Giroux who writes a lot about this, but uh, and, and it dehumanizes people when they feel like they are um, that debt balance hanging over their head. And, 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 and I read a recent article, I don't know if it was on the Atlantic or Salon, it was a progressive website, and they talked about this whole sexiness behind STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. And they, they really discuss how coding, we need coders, right? And it's not getting folks into these fields so they can get a nice job necessarily, but it's actually so they can create codes and eliminate jobs and automate things. So actually they make more money. So it's corporate driven needs and the, the, the citizens right, respond to that and okay I'm gonna go get a STEM profession not knowing actually, right, that we're, we're, we're cannibalizing ourselves, self-cannibalizing, we're eat, you know. The war on unions, there's legislation right now that's coming up uh, that wants to really destroy unions. And they're now with uh, Gorsuch on the bench, there is a chance, right, that that might become reality, especially with um, 45, right? So, um, Scary times, desperate times call for desperate measures. Um, we're really glad to be here and, um, and thank you for coming out. We want to honor your time. <laughs>